Valerie Bowling, Programming Director at the Conference Forum, and we're here doing 10 questions with our pod keynote presenter, MIT's Professor Dr. Robert Langer, who always asks the big questions in science, and I would imagine elsewhere. And Dr. Langer, these questions are the most cited from our pod community. So, number one, how did you become an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I wasn't trying to become an entrepreneur, but you know, we had made some discoveries um, in the 1970s and on, on controlled release, and I wanted to see them used, and nobody seemed to care. But after about 10 years, finally, you know, a couple companies would um, ask me if I'd be a consultant, and I mentioned some of the patents we had, and, and I was very excited that they actually licensed those patents. They gave me a you know, not only a consulting fee, but a big a grant. And, and I thought, most importantly, they would develop them. They were two multi-billion dollar companies. One was International Minerals and Chemicals, which at the time was developing animal health products. And the other was Eli Lilly. And they were mm -hmm. monitored for insulin. But what happened is they would do a few experiments. And if they didn't work out so well, then they kind of gave up. And you know, there just wasn't the same commitment or passion, say, that I had. And I remember about a year or two later, then Alex Klebanoff, who was one of my friends, still is one of my very best friends, and he said, Bob, we should start a company ourselves. And we started a little company called Enzatech. I was able to get those patents back. Several of our students started uh, working on it there. And that led to a lot of products. That company basically is what Alchemy's is today. And, and I mean, it was the nucleus of it. And so I could see that when you had your, you know, people who were passionate about it in these small companies, you know, they, they would do great things, you know, and it was a totally different scenario than the, the large companies, and so I just kept doing it. Okay, all right, number two. Uh, with so many startups, what are your thoughts on what makes one successful versus not so successful? Yeah, well, actually, sadly for me, that's an easy, uh, easy answer for that. The no most important thing in my experience has been the chief executive officer. And I suppose another thing that could be, though I haven't had that issue so much, is uh, the investors. Uh, I think I've always had great, I think, very, very good investors. Uh, but not everybody does. Uh, and I think it's important that investors realize, especially in medical area, you know, that you have long time horizons and things like that. But I've, I've always had great investors. But I'd say I've had a spectrum of CEOs who I've worked with from people who are spectacular to people who are pretty good to people who are fair. I have a lot of very good investors that I've worked with and they you know, keep working with me and, and that's been great. But the CEO, that's, uh, that's been critical for me. Okay, those are the critical components. Okay, thank you. Number three, with regards to biotech hubs, Boston, Cambridge area being one of many examples, what makes a region successful for startups? Well, I think one of the things that I think has been very, very important, the way I look at it, has been, and again, I'm prejudiced since I'm at one of them, is universities. I think having MIT, I don't think it's any accident to me that the two biggest hubs, the way I see are, are you know, Kendall Square and Cambridge and Palo Alto and, you know, in California, uh, because of MIT and Stanford. That has been so critical as to have you know, those great universities with, I think, a lot of things at those universities that have facilitated spinning things out and, and, a, and a culture of doing so. I think beyond that, lots of other things can help. I think you can have better laws. Um, and I, you know, I think you can have, uh, I mean, there are places like New York has doing things like tax-free New York. Mm -hmm. California has put in $3 billion for, for stem cell research mm -hmm. and things like that. All those things are helpful. But the number one thing, I think, is, is really great universities. Okay, thank you. Number four, how do you relate so well to both the academic world and the business world? Well, I don't, I don't know if I do, but I mean... Well, people think you do. Okay, they think I do. <laughs> so I would say, you know, I mean, academics, I'm, I'm an academic, and I, I love that. I love working with students, and I love, you know, the science, and I love the teaching. I think the students that I work with know that, and I care about them, and I think they know that too. With companies, I, I just, I really think it's just that I want to make things work. I, I think I'm a fairly easy person to get along with, and I 
you know, and I want to see these things that we're involved in translate into things that are going to help mm -hmm. people. And I think the people, in, and, I, and I'll spend whatever time is needed to do it, and I think the people in the business community know that too. Which leads into my next question. What could the business world learn from the academic world? Well, it's complicated just because of the way the business world is structured, but I think what the academic world does that's good is, is think about things in long time horizons. You know, I think that you know, if you're a company, especially if you're a public company and you have to, you know, talk about your quarterly earnings and things like that, sometimes it's hard to be thinking seriously and put big investments 10, 15 years, 20 mm -hmm. years into the future. And if you're in academics, I mean, I mean, most of what I do is probably going to be 10, 15, 20 or more years mm -hmm. in the future in terms of, you know, when it will have impact. So I think more attention to being great in the future is important. And I think that if you look back at the history of companies, I mean, I think it's, it's also true because so many companies that were great 20 years ago aren't necessarily great today, and, mm -hmm. and part of the reason is they haven't done it. Part of the problem with that is that the incentives aren't necessarily there for the people to do it. In other words, if you're you know, the CEO in, in um, 1996, you're probably not going to be there in 2016. But you know, if you're a professor, I mean, you probably are. Mm -hmm. Number six. In helping so many scientists, what leadership tip could you share with those of us who want to contribute to the success of others? I, I just think that it's important for people to know that you care about them, to know that you'll do whatever you can to make their life better, to help them in any way you can. I mean, that's, you know, I feel that as a teacher, but I feel that as in everything I do. I mean, that, you know, I, you just want people to know that they're welfare, their success is, is, is important to you. That was my favorite question, by the way, out of our 10. Well, but that's a good question. <laughs> number seven, this is, what is the most important attribute in managing so many responsibilities? Uh, knowing how to delegate, I think, uh, okay. is probably the key, and having great people you can delegate to. Okay. Number eight, what are you currently excited about in drug delivery? Well, I'm excited about a number of things in drug delivery. I'm excited about nanotechnology in terms of targeting uh, drugs to specific places, but also in terms of the ability to deliver newer molecules like mm -hmm. siRNA, mRNA, DNA. I'm excited about intelligent delivery systems, one that's, that you can use maybe remote control to get any kind of delivery pattern you want. And I'm excited about non-invasive delivery, I mean ways of delivering more complex molecules through the skin, through the intestine, to the brain. Um, any part of the body. Okay. Number nine, when you were a kid, did you imagine yourself as a professor and scientific entrepreneur? And if not, what did you imagine at that time? Yeah, I certainly didn't imagine myself as a professor or scientific entrepreneur. I, uh, I, um, I mean, not even close. You know, exactly what I did imagine myself, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I liked sports. I'd play baseball and football and stuff like that. I, I, but I don't know that I thought I was good enough to be a, a great athlete or something mm -hmm. like that either. Lots of different things would flow through my mind, but I, I didn't really know. Okay. Number 10, if you had more time, what would you spend it on? I'd probably exercise more, you know. I exercise okay. a lot, but I'd probably exercise more. Okay. A bonus question. Okay. Okay. So you were born in Albany, and yes. you went to Cornell, yeah. but you've been here for a long time. Yes. So is it Yankees or Red Sox? Oh, oh, it's not even close. It's uh, absolutely it's Red Sox. This will show my age, but when I grew up in Albany, I uh, my dad, you know, there, there were three uh, New York teams: the D Brooklyn Dodgers, the yeah, New York yeah. Yankees, and the New York oh, Giants. Oh, my father went to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah, so oh, yeah, so right. I, I I mean, so my dad was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, so I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And if you were a Brooklyn Dodger fan, you hated the Yankees as much as if you were a Red Sox uh -huh. fan. So okay. I Which, never, like, the, the people that support the Mets feel this way, right? I imagine you're right, but the Dodgers would end up playing the Yankees in the World Series over and over again, and they'd always lose. So it was, <laughs> I mean, the only, I remember finally, I remember I was seven years old. Yeah, I was going to say you must have been really young at the I, time. I, I was. But I do have, I mean, if, for anybody that follows baseball, I, I have the Dodgers in 1955 for the first time in history won the World Series. And my aunt dated a sports writer, and so she had... Um, got me this baseball, and their baseball in 
1955 is uh, just a great baseball. It's got uh, Jackie Robinson on the oh. one hand and Sandy Koufax on the other and wow. a lot of other great Duke Snyder. It was, it was a, but it was an interesting time. Wow. There's a woman called Dor Doris Kearns Goodwin. She's a famous mm -hmm. historian. Oh, yes. And uh, she's written all these great books. And she's a huge Red Sox fan, but she wrote a book called Wait Till Next Year. And that's a book when she was a little girl. She, her dad would take her to baseball games and she would actually even fill out the scorecards and it was she'd follow the Dodgers. But anyhow. <laughs> Dr. Langer, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.